So this panel discussion uh, is covering the theme of sustainable planet and economy. And uh, some of the fun and challenges that we have in trying to organize events like this are figuring out who are the right people to put on the panel. And I think we have, an, have a fantastic panel. Uh, I'll let our moderator do the introductions, but I get the opportunity to introduce our moderator. So Rosalie Clausen is a uh, political science professor. She served as the department head for six years of the political science department here until she was asked by the university to assume the role of the interim director of Purdue's Policy and Research Institute. PPRI. So Sirius and PPRI have had a, a relationship for a number of years, but since Rosie has taken Shoot. over as its interim director, uh, our relationships have, have, have strengthened and grow, grown a lot closer. So uh, I could present this as an opportunity as one more step in trying to draw our two organizations closer, or I could say this is payback for Rosie asking me to moderate a panel a few weeks ago at her event. So with that, Rosie, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Joel. Uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, welcome to the panel. I'm securing science weeks toward a sustainable economy and planet. Uh, as many of you know, sustainability is one of the themes. I think there's a button. Switch. On. Switch. Yeah? Better? Thank you. All right, let me start all over. Good afternoon. Welcome to the panel on securing giant leaps toward a sustainable economy and planet. As many of you know, sustainability is one of the major themes of Purdue's celebration of our 150th anniversary. Um, as a political scientist who studies American politics, uh, we certainly know that our policymakers are sometimes vexed by uh, problems and issues like sustainability. Uh, and if you pay attention to congressional hearings and presidential tweets, you might also think that uh, our policymakers are, are vexed when it comes to issues of technology in general and cybersecurity in particular. So it's a pleasure to be here today with these four experts who can actually shed light on uh, sustainability and cybersecurity, and I'm happy to introduce them today. Uh, first, we have, um, I'm gonna start over on your far right. We have John uh, Sutherland, uh, professor in Faisenfeld, family head of environmental <coughs> and ecological engineering. Um, he received his BS, MS, and PhD degrees from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's one of the world's leading authorities on the application of sustainability principles to design, manufacturing, and other industrial issues. He's often uh, thought of as uh, the pioneering the field of green manufacturing. Uh, next, we have Simon Hunt. He's the Executive Vice President uh, for Cybersecurity Product Innovation at MasterCard. Uh, before joining MasterCard, Simon held a number of senior leadership roles within a variety of tech companies. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in marine biology oceanography from the University, of College, University College of North Wales, Bangor. And he uh, is a market leader, speaker, inventor, and author in privacy, encryption, and endpoint security. <laughs> We also have Steve Chapin, lead cybersecurity researcher at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. He has uh, a dual BS in mathematics and computer science from Heidelberg University and MS and PhD degrees from Purdue University in computer science. He served on the faculty at Kent State, University of Virginia, Syracuse. He recently moved to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory to continue his work on securing the power grid. And we, finally, we have Haney Abdel Khalik, Associate Professor of Nuclear Engineering here at Purdue. He received his BS in Nuclear Engineering at Alexandria University, Egypt, and his MS and PhD in Nuclear Engineering at North Carolina State. His research focuses on computational reactor physics, reduced order modeling, and complexity reduction, uncertainty quantification and sensitivity analysis, analysis and data assimilation, and model calibration. We are pleased to have these four speakers with us today. We are gonna start with John and then move across the panel. Um, I've asked them to, each for, to speak for a few minutes, uh, but also to leave time for 
questions from the audience. So thank you, panelists. All right, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Absolutely. All right. So uh, again, I'm John Sutherland. Uh, I know a couple things. I know I'm a manufacturing person because that's what I was trained in. And over the last almost 30 years, I've, uh, um, for better or for worse, I've become a leader in the area of green manufacturing, or we say sometimes sustainable manufacturing. I know very little about cybersecurity, but I've been talking to, to David quite a bit, and, and so we now recognize that, uh, and I've known this for a while, that cybersecurity as it relates to manufacturing is an incredibly critical area. Uh, I thought it was appropriate for me to kind of kick things off to make sure that we're all on the same page with regard to sustainability because uh, like I know very little about uh, cybersecurity, perhaps some of you may, may not be very familiar with the idea of sustainability. So sustainability essentially says that we should be operating in a way today and into the future so that future generations have the same opportunities that we enjoy today. So that means we need to use resources in a certain way today so that future generations have access to resources. We don't want to drown ourselves in waste today uh, and thus uh, hurt future generations. So all this has implications in how we design products, how we design manufacturing processes and other uh, systems, uh, how we operate them, and how we behave as we move into the future. Oftentimes we say that sustainability, sometimes people think it only means uh, the environment, but in fact sustainability implies much more than that. It means that we need to be thinking long term about our, our, uh, our world around us, so in fact the environment, but we also have to think about uh, society and the social systems that make up our lives, of which one of them is the economy. And that's why we have this sustainable economy and planet theme for the Purdue's 150th anniversary. So I, in particular, do research and teach in the area of, of sustainability as it relates to manufacturing. And there the idea is all about anticipating some of these challenges with regard to manufacturing and then trying to avoid creating problems that we have to clean up in the future. Simon. So, yes, yeah, so I have two roles in MasterCard. The first is to bring or to support the, the cybersecurity solutions that our banks and our merchants globally support. And MasterCard is about 52 million merchants, 25,000 banks, nearly 3 billion cardholders. Does anyone in this room not have a MasterCard? I have, I have. You have one? Yeah. That's all that matters. Yeah. Um, more than one. Um, so yes, yeah, so the whole ecosystem. Now, uh, MasterCard would say this is important because cash sucks. Yeah, If you get robbed and you lose your cash, it's gone. Yeah, If you give cash to the wrong person, it's gone. Um, it takes a lot of water and chemicals to make cash. You've got to ship it around. It generally is hideously archaic. Um, and electronic transactions solve a lot of these problems. Yeah, if you give it to the wrong person, you can get it back. If somebody steals your card, it doesn't matter. There are so many tangible benefits, which is why we give refugees prepaid cards. Why, if you're, uh, if you're on benefits in the US, you get a prepaid credit card. There are so many uh, solutions that work for poor, the digitally disenfranchised, the unbanks, that are better without cash. So MasterCard is, is all big in that world, and my world is making sure that when you use your card online, that you get your stuff, you know, that, it, that the money doesn't go to the wrong place, that if you're scammed, you get your money back. And most of the work my teams do are about blocking the ability for cyber criminals to generate revenue. We steal shit from hackers. We destroy their reputations. We are angry pursuers of cyber criminals uh, within the law but then we work with law enforcement to go that extra step and get them tased. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we, we really take, the, I mean, my team take, is very passionate about any leakage of money to cyber criminals because these are not teenagers buying games. These are Russian gra gangs, Ukrainian criminal gangs. There's so much social evil. The, the money stole, from, stole through cyber crime pays for drug manufacturing, guns, prostitution, human trafficking. So part of my job is, 
looking at all the possible ways people can monetize electronic transactions to illegally, and how do we stop it? Uh, the second part of my job is interesting in that in it's the first time in 30 years I can actually claim my degree is useful. Um, we, uh, I am responsible for uh, how the cards are made. So the plastic your card is made of, the chip, the hologram on it, the mag stripe, all the standards and physical requirements of a credit card that you have in your pocket, a MasterCard, come through my group. Uh, and that's important because, has, any, has anyone broken a card recently? Has anyone had a card break before it was renewed? That's because of the way we make the cards. We have to make this card, it's not single-use plastic. It has to last three years, has to never snap, work every time, it has to go through a cash machine or a fuel pump and come back out again. It, it can't fail because if the card breaks, it destroys your opinion of that bank, perhaps, of electronic transactions. If the card lets you down, that's a big deal. Um, and part of my world is how do I make those cards, which are about one thousandth of one percent of the plastic production in the world. It's about three billion cards a year. How do I, what do I do with them when, when three years is up? How do I recycle them? Um, it's, they're made of very, very many different plastics. They're not made very sustainably, typically, because they have to have such a long life. I have a machine that twists them to check when they bend and things. But how do we turn that into a, into a model where we can use sustainable uh, bioplastics, ocean source plastics, and still give you the confidence that when you put it in the cash machine that it will come back out again? Um, so that's the second part of my job. First part is, is the cyber world. The second is the physical, the cryptography of the chip, stopping people stealing it. Do you, does anyone notice we got rid of signatures earlier on this year? Because it was useless, nobody was paying any attention. So those kind of standards are the second part of my life. That's me. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna be talking about some of the work done at the National Lab, and in particular at Lawrence Livermore uh, through the Department of Energy. And we're looking at sustain sustainability from the uh, point of view of our energy sources. So um, we, one, of the, one of the initiatives at Livermore is the National Ignition Facility, which is working on, it's the world's most powerful laser. It's figuring out how we can uh, sustainably produce fusion power. Um, we talk about energetic materials at the lab, which is pseudocode for things that go boom. And I don't work with that part of the lab. Um, another initiative we have within the DOE is advanced manufacturing that ties into what John was saying earlier. Again, not my part of the lab. My part of the lab is looking at the electric grid. Um, so for example, California had um, about 330,000 EVs um, put on the road between 2001, 2011 and 2018, about a seven year period. We plan within California in the next seven year period to have five million EVs on the road. About half the EVs sold in the US are bought in California. Um, so we have a vast increase in the demands that will be placed on our electric, in, electric grid in California. Also, there's a new rule going into effect next year in California that all single family re residences and smaller apartment buildings must have solar panels placed on the roof. So now we have new production being put into the grid. So what we're looking at is how we can incorporate these escalating demands and new dispersed distributed energy resources into the grid in such a way that it'll be as reliable as it was for us and for our, our, our generations before. Um, this is a real challenge because many of the devices that are being put out into the grid, so the Internet of Things has come to the grid. Um, every, every charger you see has a computer in it, okay? The inverter for your solar panel and the real-time automation controller for that inverter are computers. So now we have computers pervading the electric grid, but they're not built with security specifications that someone like me some, with a background in security would want to see. By the way, I'm, I'm not a sustainability expert at all. So I'm, take John, I'm his perfect complement. Okay, I don't know anything really about sustainability other than liking electric vehicles and things like that. So, so we, our task is to build a castle in the swamp. Uh, if you think yeah. of the Monty Python and the Holy Grail uh, skit where we, 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 yes. <laughs> we don't get four chances at it though. We have to make it stay up the first time. So um, I'm leading a couple of projects looking at that, at, at EVs, at solar inverters. Third project we're looking at is looking at the firmware 
that's in these devices. So for those of you who are in the room for the Intel talk at 115, um, a lot of the issues that he was discussing about trusting that low-level software that's in your device, uh, we're looking at some of those. We have a project at Livermore called the Rose Compiler Toolkit that can do binary analysis. And so we're using that to do analysis of the code that's coming on devices from manufacturers looking for vulnerabilities. So we're trying to attack the sustainability problem from the bottom up and giving us better energy resources. My, uh, my name is Hany Abdelkalik. So uh, just like any good uh, person serving on a panel, the first thing you look at, who are your co-panelists, right? <laughs> so I noticed there are very, very little common chance that we will meet in real life. Name <laughs> <laughs> Serious only can make that happen. So I try to find some common thread between, between us that relates to what I do. Uh, I'm interested in nuclear reactors, security, and so how does that relate to financial market, you know, uh, behavioral science, biological? So I think the common theme here between all of us is that we're all looking for patterns, trying to find patterns uh, to make decisions based on them. So in engineering, uh, we write physics models and eventually turn them into computer codes and we use them to control systems. Those are all based on patterns that humans can see and then hopefully we rely also on the computers to see these patterns and automate our ability to find these patterns. The same thing, you know, in the financial market, you're also trying to find patterns of misuse. Uh, and when we couple that with, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, we're just trying to make this process more efficient, more accurate. But uh, the thing that I would like to Thing point out in this talk, hopefully will come through to you, is that like uh, the previous panel, I think Professor Clifton mentioned that, uh, that we have to distinguish between what we can do and what the machine can do, what we are good at and what the machine is, is good at. So how does that relate to what I'm doing? I'm interested in uh, nuclear reactors. In the first 15 years of my career was focusing, I was interpreting the word sustainable to mean good economy, improving the economy of the system and making sure it's safe. So safety to me means that things can break but it doesn't mean that the pipe will probably conspire with the control rod and, you know, and a sensor to give you false information. So that led me in the last four years to look into the security aspect of things. That's when there's conspiracy and that's usually driven by a human. So uh, the challenging part here is when you're talking just about system falling apart on their own, there's no conspiracy and you can write models for them, you can detect patterns and you can develop AI techniques to do that. But once humans are involved in the loop, Every time you see a pattern, they change their pattern. So, you know, we know each other, two friends know each other for how many years, can you still predict their behavior? So I think that's what makes the security problem more distinguished from the safety and the economy problem is that if we just rely on AI solely uh, and machine learning type techniques, it's gonna be challenging. So maybe we have to rethink a little bit how, how we desi design these, uh, these patterns as we try to identify these th security threats. And um, the detection of these patterns obviously will depend on how much the attacker knows about you, going from extremely being on the outside to being part of your organization. And you know, when you read some of the statistics about the threats coming from the inside, you feel like you want to fire everybody that works for you. But uh, this, is, this is a reality today. So we have to take that into account when we're designing uh, detection, pattern detection techniques, whether you want to call them AI or machine learning uh, or just statistical inference techniques. So was that? Thank you. Do you have any questions for one another while people maybe come to the mic and uh, see if? Well, I think I'll comment on something Haney said. Yeah. So one of the projects we're working on, the EV project, is less about the security aspect and more about the safety aspect. As I mentioned, we're looking at growth up to 5 million EVs. And if everybody plugs in at the same time, the grid can't deal with that. So we're looking at how we can schedule those charging sessions so that we, we smooth out the demand on the grid. So for that project, we really are working more in the safety space. We are concerned about security. We are, we are looking at making it so that these collaborative charging um, nodes can detect when one of them goes, goes rogue or has been maliciously hacked. But the first order thing we're looking at is safety. And then with the, the solar inverter project, we are looking at this sort of conspiracy where someone may have hacked into the central controller or some of our nodes and dealing with that. So, so we are seeing some of the same issues crop up across different disciplines. John, did you want to add anything or Simon? No, no let's oh, get some okay. questions. <laughs> let's put the audience on the spot. Do we have questions from the audience? 
Here I come. We're going to call on people yeah. otherwise. Yeah. Um, yes, would you describe the difference between cause and effect local versus cause and effect at scale and how that factors in sustainability? All of us? Uh, whoever feels most qualified. Go for it. Right, so cause and effect local, where to me as an engineer, I'm looking at a single effect or single physics or single component. And uh, what I look for here is can I reverse engineer that process or can I learn it from observing how the system behaves? And uh, we, to validate my understanding, I build experiments to, to test my understanding uh, by changing one parameter at a time and just see the effect on the system. And I think this problem is very, very well understood. We can, we can rely on AI and machine learning and inference techniques to, to build such models. Uh, but when you start talking about multiple systems being put together, then there's, there's all these cross products and cross effects that go between them. In principle, you can model them. And that's why in the last 20 years, you hear about uh, high fidelity, advanced models, multi-physics, multi-scale, all these coined words basically mean building much more comprehensive models. But they're really all still based on our understanding of how the system uh, works. So if we have much more powerful computing, then this still cause and effect across systems can still be described. Now, can we do that using AI? Depending on who you talk to. But I personally believe uh, AI is very good once you have a, a one of our previous uh, speakers said you have a good ontology of your system and you have good data that you can train uh, your ontology on. But if you don't have a good description of the system, then I think AI will be giving you spurious correlations or things you can't explain and you end up spinning your wheels trying to understand what they mean. So uh, the answer is, I think, with, with this exascale computing, quantum computing, all these computing power that we have, yes, we can understand the cause and effect for a multi-scale um, big, big system, basically. Uh, did that answer the question? So I, I was just going to add one quick thing. Um, some things in life are, are important at an overall level and, you know, could be spatial, could be long term, um, time, temporal scale, but sometimes more local effects are important. Um, years ago we used to do an industry short course and We'd say, well, somebody walks in, they've got one uh, foot in a bucket of ice cold water and another foot in a bucket of boiling hot water. And somebody says, well, how are you doing? And say, well, on the average, pretty good. <laughs> um, so sometimes uh, the, the, the average and the overall higher, higher order uh, um, perception has meaning, but sometimes it's the local things that matter. Water is a local issue. It, in terms of environmental sustainability. And uh, I talked, I was down at Cummins yesterday and they mentioned that uh, a lot of their plants now they're having to ship in water for their production processes. So that becomes kind of a local sustainability issue. Um, we don't always appreciate it here in the Midwest that water is a global challenge. On the other hand, uh, because of mixing and so forth, things like CO2 and other uh, global warming, greenhouse gases, you know, these are everywhere. In terms of um, local versus global, w when you look at the grid, our, the historic electric grid is very much, you can think of it as center out or top down tree structure. Where we have centralized uh, generation transmission lines going to distribution networks like you see in any neighborhood. What's happening as we bring on, for example, the solar powers in California or other distributed energy resources is we're starting to have production at the edges of the grid. And when we look at what's happening with electric vehicles, the next step of technology is something called V2G, vehicle two grid. So traditional charging we call V1G. I think that's a, a retronym. It was added after V2G was brought up. But <laughs> so, so V1G is just charging. V2G is actually my car can now push electric power out yeah. into the grid. So my car is now uh, a mobile generator and um, demand for electricity. And so coordinating that is an interesting problem. Um, but so we're looking at distribution grid issues. But if we're managing our distribution, distribution grids better, that takes load off of our transmission grid. 
All right, and when you, uh, I'll employ a time-honored trick of taking a word you said and answering a slightly different question. You asked about scale. So um, when we're looking at the grid, certain things we have minutes to hours to, to solve the problem. Um, it's, we know what, what a demand curve looks like fairly typically. We have day-ahead markets. We can predict what the demand will be tomorrow roughly. So we can decide some charging um, scheduling well in advance. But for other applications, such as uh, frequency regulation or voltage regulation, we need to be making decisions within about a four-second or a sub-second interval. And so we're doing decentralized distributed computation. And so we have real questions about how well we can scale our local solutions up because of these time constraints. So we see scale in that dimension as well. So let me add one more thing. Uh, also, from a security perspective, if I, if I think about a nuclear reactor, uh, somebody who's trying to cause a malicious outcome to the reactor, they could think about the coupling between the local and the global effects. We may have a lot of monitors that the operator sees that are maintained. As long as you maintain the same power, you, you maintain certain margins, then you're operating fine. But there may be some local effects that are being initiated in different parts of the reactor that eventually accumulate over time, causing uh, global effect that at that point you wouldn't understand where it came from and you would have to shut down the reactor. So if you understand these patterns at the local level and the global level from the attacker perspective, you can start thinking about how to introduce these changes and cause an outcome that, you know, would basically, uh, they will have to shut down the system and try to figure out what happened. Okay, so for the underlying like control systems you were talking about for controlling power grids, it's mostly for Steve. <clears throat> have you found any really interesting solutions that these IoT companies have done or received any pushback from manufacturers when you have tried to put sort of regulations in for the manufacturing of those things? So we don't do regulation. Oh, okay. But what we do is, is build technology solutions. We're not allowed to compete with industry. We work with industry partners we come up with solutions to problems that may not be the same way they're looking at the problem. And then we work with them to see if what we've come up with can help them. For example, th now both of the projects I've talked about mostly, the EV project and the, the solar project, are relatively new. They started last, last October, coincident when I started at the lab. So that's just, I said, hey, here are two, you're new here? Take on two projects. I said, okay. So um, with EV, we're working with a large network operator of charging stations, and we're developing our solution in software that we will be installing. We're using Raspberry Pis as, as, as mock-ups for the moment. Um, we will then be porting our software to their charging stations, deploying them in a test bed to see how they work, and then see whether they think that's something that's commercializable. That's actually the part of the problem I understand the least. That's, that happens in year three, is figuring out how to commercialize this technology. Um, and part of it is it's a complete reversal of the paradigm. Everybody in these industries works with very much centralized, cloud-based, but still centralized solutions. We're trying to move away from that and go to decentralized, edge-based computing um, so that we can uh, ameliorate certain kinds of attacks. We're removing single points of failure from the system. Okay, so it's a... It, we do technology and then we work with them to try, try to get it integrated into their products. Thank you. So I'm gonna change focus a little bit, or attempt to at least. Um, so John, you had pointed out in the beginning that you often, uh, uh, sustainable can be equated to green manufacturing often, mm -hmm. or energy efficient. Uh, and energy efficient is prevalent in many discussions right now as well as cybersecurity, but they're not often teamed together. Uh, there's actually a, a mm -hmm. Department of Energy grant right now mm -hmm. that's actually taking a look at, uh, at some of these type of things. So, um, and then if when we talk about power generation, power distribution, uh, and even the economy, uh, that often we talk about security means availability and, and stability. Uh, so, but if we try to put these together, are there cyber, cyber physical, system security, whatever it might be, that actually can add to green technologies, more than just making sure that the power grid is there and available and not attacked, or that our, that uh, the power generation is safe, those type of things, or that our manufacturing is safe, but can these two very disciplined, very different disciplines come together that security can actually be a green technology? Well, let me start, and, I, and I'll 
confess that I don't have the answer, but you know, like a good faculty member, I can stand up and talk without <laughs> knowing, knowing of what anything. I speak. Yeah. Um, so, so, and and just as background, I will note that the the government has been uh, uh, sponsoring millions of dollars of work in the area of smart manufacturing, um, which. Um, I guess parallels the development of smart everything else these days, smartphones and smart highways and smart this and smart. Um, so um, because I'm a manufacturing person, I'm also often called upon to try to figure out what this big idea means in terms of something um, that's more implementable. So uh, as we are pursuing these areas of smart, this generally means um, uh, many more sensors than we have been using previously in a manufacturing environment, be it on a process or a system enterprise-wide. Um, could be even on products uh, throughout their lifetime. And then using remote communication technology, you know, wireless communication technology, sending this information to some central point where decisions, uh, the data is analyzed and decisions are then formulated and communicated back to the, to whatever it was, process, system, product. So this then becomes smart, pro smart manufacturing, smart products. Now if we do not figure out how to uh, secure these communications, we are going to have a world of problem. Uh, we have problems now where basically um, high-tech manufacturers have kind of um, cut themselves off from uh, modern communications because of the fear of being hacked, uh, making secure product or important products and maybe military-type products. They, they want to avoid that. So th this is kind of a pervasive ubiquitous problem that we need to address. So if you give me a chance to also talk All right. out of my mouth here, like a normal professor doesn't know what he's talking about. So if you notice in the last several years also, the Department of Energy has been talking about these uh, hybrid energy systems, trying to you know uh, maximize the performance of all the different types of energy production sources that we have, like nuclear, wind, solar, all share, I mean, despite the differences in technologies, they all share a common goal, climate you know, change issues and greenhouse gases, et cetera. So as we couple all these different systems together, there will be a lots of different byproducts out of it. Like uh, if we start thinking about how do you secure uh, the supply chain for all of them when you start putting them together, I think byproduct you will learn about their vulnerabilities when you put them <coughs> together. So. The looking at the security will help you ensure that they're also safer from an engineering point of view. Like you will discover a lot of things that you did not have to think about when you were looking at a single system. So I think that's in a way an indirect effect of using security to understand uh, the vulnerabilities about your system. I think to convince people to take a higher tech solution, you have to convince them it's secure mm -hmm. and that it won't be taken away from them, it won't lose function. I, I'll give you an example. If if electric cars were less safe than gasoline cars, nobody would want them. So we have to ensure people they're safer, they're more secure, they're better, they're more reliable, etc. to push people to make the greener decision to go electric. Uh, and electric cars are interesting to me because in 10 years' time, we're going to have 20 million lithium batteries we need to recycle. And that's not a very environmentally friendly problem. Um, but at the moment, we're hedging our bets that by then, someone will who have found a way of monetizing recycling Tesla batteries. Um, so our children, basically. Um, but I, I think secure, cyber security and security is foundational to convincing people to take a more technologically advanced solution over something they're familiar with, which, which whether it's green or not, greener, I should say, is an attribute of why people want the new thing. But if it's not safe, it's not secure, yeah. if a hacker could take it away from you or break it, if a hacker can steer you off the road. And believe me, I, I drove a Subaru with lane control last night, 
and I would have arrested me if I'd followed me. It was all over the road, and there was no hacker involved even. <laughs> um, but convincing me to take that, it's got to be safer. And if it's greener, that's a compelling reason to switch. But if it's greener and unsafe, there's no way I'd, no, whatever it is. That's the societal dimension yeah. of sustainability. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have a Tesla Model 3. I did not buy the autopilot stuff, but they had a free trial last fall. You're lucky there, you got here. There's a, there's a particular interchange in, in near, near where I live in California where an entrance ramp onto a highway divides into two. So you go from a normal lane to a really wide Y-shaped lane with no center line for a while, and then there's a center line. And my car did this. Yep. <laughs> until, until it found and a lot until a it line. found the second line, then it was happy. So <laughs> tracking problem. Yeah, some. Um, um, one of the things that that I'm, I'm pushing for on for uh, initiatives to come in in the lab is going to be more use of formal methods, because uh, you, Simon talked about trust. Yeah. And we so to to trust a system, you want to be able to make statements about what it does. And right now. When, how, many people, how many people know that you use digital signatures whenever you download software? Right? So, okay. So, I mean, in the, in the background, when, when you're updating your apps, there, there are digital signatures going on, all right? Um, and there are signed certificates there. But all that really tells you is that this came from Apple or Microsoft or whoever you're downloading from. It doesn't tell you what that software does. And that's what we want to do more of as an outgrowth of some of the work in rows, is being able to, to testify and prove to you things the software does or does not do so that you can have higher confidence in the software. So that's one of our methods of working on some of these problems with Internet of Things and firmware updates is, is can we make provable statements about the behavior of the software? It doesn't directly answer your question, but it's a way that it's a way that it can improve the trustworthiness of some of these systems that people want to move to and then overcome some of the reluctance of manufacturers perhaps to open up their systems to communicate with the outside world. If we can prove to them that certain um, problems can't occur, they may be more willing to do that. So this question is really for Simon. Yeah. Uh, looking through your printed bio here, I saw uh, he holds a number of patents on diverse topics such as authentication, encryption, smart matter, which is the one that kind of caught my eye. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little more to how cybersecurity factors into your process for developing a physical product like this. I'm assuming it's something like the plastic you were talking about in your introduction. And if it, if it involves a supply chain, like how, how do you... Uh, how does cybersecurity factor into your choice and selection of, of vendors and your, um, your verification sure. processes? So the Smart Matter patent, so I had the privilege of working for Intel for a few years, and I also ran the patent group for McAfee, so I got to patent any, I got to explore patenting anything I wanted. So drones and Smart Matter were topics at the time. Um, I always look at things I'm trying to bring to market, and I always pessimistically look at how they could be misused uh, and that usually involves how can some bored teenager subvert my beautiful thing and make it ugly um, so and that that pers that permeates my entire life I mean when I hire contractors to work on my house if I can't pay them electronically I don't do business with them I'm not going to go to the bank and get cash because what if I'm robbed you know what if they claim I didn't give them the cash so I look at the cyber and the security angle in everything I do from, from the point of view of how could things be misused. Because if, you know, if I see lots of people with Dells, for instance, if I could demonstrate that I could make that Dell catch fire right now, you'd never use it again, and you'd never buy another Dell. So Dell themselves do a lot of work to make sure that can't happen, that they can't, that battery cannot be misused. You know, there are so many protections on overloading it, power, charging, etc to stop somebody subverting the beautiful thing of a Dell laptop into a little explosive device. Um, so smart matter, um, the challenge that I was trying to explore, and this comes into your world, is how do, you, how do you measure the corrosion and the integrity of a vessel that you can't physically put a person into to inspect? So smart matter started with, what if we just poured a whole bunch of cameras into the vessel and got them to float around and measure everything? 
Well, how do those cameras interact with each other to work out the geometry of the inside of the vessel? And that's a standard mesh problem. You know, how do they know where they're touching or where the edges are? And then if you had that fantastic system that you could just pour this smart matter into something and get all the characteristics, the internal geometry, et cetera, how do you know the data you're getting out is trustworthy? So that's now when cybersecurity comes into and supply chain. So when you get that bucket of smart matter, that you know it's going to have a function that's predictable because you're pouring it in a nuclear reactor and the answer determines whether you have another three mile island. So that's where my that's where cybersecurity comes into something as as out of bound as as some smart matter that you're you're doing. Um, and if you, you've probably probably seen the movie Twister. You know, you throw those little things up in a hurricane and measures it. How do you know they're right? How do you know some teenager hasn't compromised them or China hasn't been involved in the supply chain? Or how do you have utter confidence that the data you're getting, which is so critical, is accurate and, and protected? Um, and that, pers that permeates through everything. I did some work with uh, farmers a couple of years ago who were building rain sensors in their fields. Uh, and the design had no concept of security whatsoever, no concept of integrity or authenticity of data. And I asked them, well, what, what's to stop some other farmer just telling you your fields don't need watering? And it was like, why would anyone do that? It's like, because they're bored. That's all it takes in the cyber world. Somebody's bored or somebody wants to cause a famine. Uh, and it's the same as uh, McAfee made a huge error a few years ago of publishing a paper on how to compromise insulin pumps, in, oh, embedded yes. insulin pumps, which was hysterically funny until we realized Dick Cheney had one. And then it wasn't funny at all. Um, so that's where cybersecurity permeates our lives because anything electronic or digital, if it was misused or lied to you, if you couldn't trust it anymore, you wouldn't use it. And that's how we, we, we regress, I think. Yeah. Let me let me add one thing, and and then maybe you can we'll, we'll try to pull you into yeah. the discussion. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> um, so one of the things that years ago that came up, um, we were working with Ford, and they uh, they use a polymeric material, plastic, and in making injection molded parts, but the supplier wouldn't reveal the the composition of <laughs> of the plastic. And of course, you know, that's perhaps, you know, some good thinking behind that because they're afraid that then Ford would say, well, why don't we send this out for bids yeah. and we'll, we'll get a, a better deal on the plastic. Well, when we start thinking about sustainability and now we have to communicate information about processes and components across the supply chain, well, how do we secure that? How do we, how do we, uh, protect somebody's intellectual property and and yet uh, uh, get the information we need in order to understand uh, somebody's footprint. Yeah. So I don't know. I've got a policy question for you guys. But <laughs> let, me, let me go out here first. I want to make sure all our audience gets in. So I have a, a brainstorm about two minutes ago on sustainability and AI. So, so in things like uh, manufacturing or, or building trades, there's vast amounts of waste in, say, the buildings. Like 40, 50 percent of this stuff is just thrown away because of poor cutting and tolerances and that sort of thing. So we, anywhere we could shorten that make to design process, efficiency in these ways, and AI is a really solid candidate for improving a lot of that. I, I'm going to venture the same is true in manufacturing as well. So we need advances in things like robot, robot in robots. We, we have a pretty good notion of geometry in small areas, but our robots don't really talk outside their closed world. So that's, that's my venture into sustainable. I, we need AI systems that can interact with the outside world uh, to make these things far more efficient in terms of, uh, as I said, in that building trade area where there's so much waste and we just don't have enough money or capital or skilled people to build that much housing, you know, 50 years from now. So. Once again, I'll ask you to talk about things you don't know anything about. <laughs> uh, I, I think AI is a really great contributor to efficiency. And it's hard to elude efficiency away from sustainability. You know, less waste, more sustainable. So, I, 
I guess, I guess I built five houses. My family's builders for five generations. Um, cut patterns is a very interesting conversation. Um, you know, there are, when you build a house, I mean, houses are based on sta standard size materials uh, to reduce wastage. Um, the challenge is most of the cost is people. And you're not going to get a standard builder to do a cut pattern analysis on a piece of material. He's just going to cut it in half and throw half of it away. And we are used to the cost of cost of construction. There's no, there's no compelling driver, I think, to reduce it. I think you're right that it's massively more expensive than we, it could be. But until we fight to reduce prices, we won't be able to demand higher tech solutions. And you're talking about bringing a, you know, a CNC cutter on site to cut materials, which I would love as a technologist. But I know the, the typical construction teams I've seen would destroy it immediately. <laughs> they would drop a concrete on it or something. Um, because they make money on wasted materials. It's still profit for them. Yeah. It's an interesting thought. Yeah, I'm personally a big proponent of AI. As long as you understand the process, you're basically giving the computer clear instructions, look for this objective function, change these variables, then it's a clear process and just the ability of the computer to do that very, very fast, something that we can't do. But my, my main reservation has always been asking the computer more than they're trained to do. You know, the, the usual, <coughs> usual example is, it's easy to train a, uh, your child to differentiate between a cat and a dog, but it's not easy to train a quantum computer to tell the difference between a panda and a baboon, for example. So as long as uh, we, we have a clear way to tell the computer how to do the, uh, the optimization, AI definitely should be, should be used. But uh, when it comes to security, I think the theme for this conference, the patterns come from humans, which are very difficult to predict. So and at that, that point, I think we should take AI with a grain of salt and decide exactly what we can do with it. I, I'll just make one comment. I, a couple years ago, I was attending a conference, and I was talking about smart and sustainable manufacturing and using less energy. There was a speaker from Komatsu that talked about construction. And, yeah. and so construction. You know, and and uh, you know, surveying type thing. And this is th these types of jobs have historically been very well paid. You know, uh, for for you know people that perhaps do not have a college degree, but that's all changing. So you know, now you have drones that go over and kind of map out the region. And you get 3D images of, and then they'll throw it into the software. And now you can just get some young. I was going to say kid, but that's kind of a pejorative. So a young person without much education that's driving a tractor, and they can just you know, use the joystick to, to, to follow. And they, you, know, you don't need to be paying somebody $25 an hour anymore. You can pay them $12 an hour to just do the grading of the, the overall. And uh, soon send yeah. it out on its own. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And then it is all autonomous, right? So. Uh, I, have a, I have a policy question for you then. Um, so at the Purdue Policy Research Institute, we talk a lot about how t technology is ahead of policy and that it's, it's always playing catch up to have the right regulations, to have laws on the books, and that technology is way ahead of where we are. Um, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who's running for the Democratic uh, presidential nomination, talked recently about uh, that in the United States, we basically have no tech policy, and that it, as a result, corporate tech policy is essentially public policy for technology in the United States. So I guess I'd like you to comment on that. Uh, do, do you take that to be the case, that corporate tech policy is our public policy? Um, and maybe Simon from the corporate world could speak especially, but in general, yeah. what would you say to that? And what does that mean for sustainability and the intersections with cybersecurity? So by tech policy, you mean our responsibility to protect things and do things right, or? I, I think in, in some, much of the discussion, it's yeah. very broad. Uh, issues of privacy, yeah, uh, okay. security, safety, um, yeah, so workforce I, I, impacts, all the ethical, yeah. legal, social implications of technology that so we're I, not really addressing. I still have sleepless nights about the clipper chip. 
I don't know, Gene's probably in the room, remembers Clipper. Um, when governments dictate technology, I mean, it takes them five years to write the policy, and the tech's five years old by then, and it's changed. So I, I, I spent 20 years with data protection, and I love the fact that more and more governments are holding the world accountable to protecting our data. Like, it's not the bank's data when they lose it. It's ours. It's mine. Uh, when a hospital loses my health records, it's my data, not theirs. So I love the fact there are financial penalties and huge embarrassment and all it took was thou shalt protect people's data. So it's a very, the policy there is not very broad, not very deep, doesn't describe technology and how, but it says you should use best efforts to protect people's data and if we think you didn't, it's gonna be embarrassment and fines. That's enough. Uh, and we can get better at that, but I never wanna tip over into you shall use this particular algorithm or firewall because it's just gonna be out of date and it doesn't, one size doesn't fit all. Um, in terms of MasterCard for corporate sustainability, et cetera, these are all things that differentiate the company from our peers that we do because it makes us more competitive. We do them because they're good as well. We like being good, but, let's, but it helps our share price, and that's always a good thing. Should government step in? If industry's messing up, yeah. Like if we didn't value something and there was no competitive advantage, Governments need to make us care, and that's what they did with data protection. They made it harder not to care, and then that turned it into a thing the world thought highly of. And, and people, you could compete on it. And we could compete on, and it helps our share price, and then we care. Um, in terms of tech policy, I, I would love the governments to ban bitcoins and cryptocurrencies. Because you know people don't realize Bit the, the bitcoins farming of the world now consumes more electricity than yeah. Ireland. That's great for you guys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but geez, we're worried about charging electric cars and we have these things like terabytes of terabytes of power for nothing. Um, that would be a nice government policy. Thou shalt wait, not waste electricity on crypto coins. Or unless you generate it yourself maybe. But it's dangerous when government steps in and talks technology. They need to talk about value to society, like the evils of losing your identity, is something that companies should aspire to protect. And then companies say, well, we're better than everybody else because we do that really well. And that, that changes our world. Yeah, I think you pointed out the, the two industries I'm familiar with, mm. being healthcare yeah. and banking, both have laws in effect that put the onus on yeah. the industry to do, to do policing and, and conform to standards. Um, on the, on the Bitcoin front, um, <clears throat> people are, are amazing, and everyone is a natural game player um, for, from a game theoretic perspective. So th yeah. there's a town in southern Washington state that turns out it had really cheap electric power because yeah. it was right next to a hydro facility. And so the entire town grew into a giant Bitcoin mining facility. Just wasting it. <laughs> yeah, because, because it was cheaper. It, um, it was just so cheap to get electricity there. Um, I share Simon's reluctance to have government getting involved in technology. I think when you look at the DMCA, which is a, yeah. you know, a couple of decades, almost decades old now, um, yeah. that's another example of overspecifying technological bounds within policy in that it made it very difficult to do certain kinds of reverse engineering. Um, and it, I, I think that the challenge for regulators is to define the policy in a way that addresses the shortcomings in existing legislation that is relevant to new technology without over-specifying the responses that the and the forms that the technology can take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that your example, I love that because that's kind of the uh, think global, act yeah. local, right? So, yeah. That's good. I, I was just going to comment one other thing because this is starting to emerge more and more often. We spent, I'm, I'm an engineer, right? So we spent a lot of time thinking about how to be more efficient and, and you know, whatever it is we're doing, try to, you know, really do a good job. Um, but when you talk about the Bitcoin and the government intervening in that, this is, this is the government deciding about what we should be doing which starts to get into the uh, area of effectiveness, yeah. which is more about how should we be using energy 
you know, should we be using our critical resources for scooters and, and uh, gee, I start really sounding like an old person. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, but, but th these are the hard choices, right? The value choices, the, you know, where we need the ethics and we need, you know, the uh, beyond math and science to, to help uh, guide our, and help us make the better decisions. This is the topic of, you know, what's the long-term impact of things we do? The sustainability yeah, yeah. of it, is it short-term? Are we leaving a pile of poop behind for our children or is this a sustainable thing that's, you know, improving the economy in the long run, improving everybody's ability in the long run? Thank you. And with that, thank you very much, panel. <laughs> thank you.